Hi, welcome to the world of EdCraft. My name is Sean Willems. This work is a collaboration with two colleagues, Andrew Lowe, the Charles E. and Susan T. Harris Professor of Finance at MIT Sloan School of Management, and Brian Stevens, Senior Lecturer at the Haslam College of Business at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I'm Sean. I'm the Haslam Chair in Supply Chain Analytics at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Andrew and Brian have already posted videos that document their studios. Uh, this video is the third in my six video sequence uh, to talk about what learnings I have from the studio. And in fact, I have exactly one intent for this video. So let's just jump straight to it. So my goal is to share with you the eight most significant learnings that I have had uh, in the building of my studio. So, so these, are, these are not, you know, this, these, this whole video sequence is very much targeted to faculty. You know, we assume you've already looked up the things of, you know, do your lighting better, do your sound better, do your video better. Uh, and now you're sort of looking to take a step beyond that. And, and so these are the eight most significant learnings I have found with regard to studio design. And for me, the first learning is actually to make your on-screen image larger. Invariably, whenever I meet faculty and they want to show me their OBS scenes, they are too small, right? Their image is too small. And I, I actually do think there are reasons why faculty do this. Uh, it's, it's not sort of a, that they're, you know, it, but it, it, is, it is something I've seen sort of very often. And, and there's a real problem with that. So to see it done well, these are screenshots from the videos that Andrew produced up top. And on the bottom is Brian's, uh, one of his videos for the world of EdCraft. And what we see is that their image is much larger than what you normally see uh, when you're looking at a typical OBS scene on Zoom. What's so great about this is that you can actually see the faculty member's mannerisms, right? You can see the way they interact which is just like the way we are on campus. So making your screen uh, on-screen image larger is the first thing you want to do. The second thing you want to do is make your, your image consistent across scenes. And to do that, we're going to go back to the, uh, to the Talking Head studio. And here, what, the key thing and why this is in the, the design studio uh, learnings versus, say, the teaching learnings is that we actually have to consciously create uh, some, some the representation in the studio to frame the shots such that we can create a consistent appearance across scenes. So this is my, the largest scene that, that I have, uh, you know, the largest image of me. This is when I'm you know, teaching or like when I'm sort of interacting with students or lecturing uh, as I am right now. This would be the, the image I would use if I was sort of engaged in a discussion with people. But if, for example, I want to be using the, the document camera, then I need to make space for the document, right? And so to do that, I need to take this image of me and crop it down. Now, this actually works quite well with the document camera, but if I also want to, say, show a, a PDF, or I want to interact in a different way with the, you know, with, with the computer and, and, and the students, well then at that point, you know, again, back to the first principle, we still want me to be large enough that you can see my mannerisms, but we actually, we actually want to devote more space to the, the whatever computer output it is. And even further than this, there are times when I'll want to actually show pictures of things and I make myself even smaller. I used to actually not be in this shot, but students complained. They said that they actually liked it when I was, when I was on, uh, you know, sort of in the consistency across the, the scene. So I actually did that. So what we have here is the full picture. Here, I've been cropped. Here, I have been shrunken. And here, I have been shrunken even more, right? So to make this shot consistent, what we need to do is we need to set up markers. We, well, we need to frame the shots, first of all. 
But then next what we need to do is actually give me markers so that I can actually, uh, so I can actually see it. And there is one right here uh, on the table, but I actually never look at that. There's also uh, the keyboard, which is actually pretty good at it. But the easiest marker for me is actually behind me. So is to give space for my shoulders so that I can see that, hey, when I'm in this spot, you know, between these items, I'm good. Whereas if I'm sort of over more, you know, this might not be such a particularly big deal for this shot. But as we start to look at like this shot, it looks a little, you know, the, the being off center because things are now cropped in is, uh, is I'd say more problematic. So the second learning is that we want, to, uh, we want to make sure that we've made our image consistent across the different scenes. The third is that we want to actually block all of the ambient light. And that is, uh, in, in this room, in this particular studio, my studio space, there are seven windows and there's uh, uh, double French doors. So there's actually a lot of natural light that could be coming in but we need to block all of it. And in particular, what you see here uh, are the three sort of south-facing uh, windows and they're currently, the, you know, the shades are up. So when you look at this, this light is actually pretty good. So there's, there's no other light in the studio right now except for, the, uh, except for the document camera, which never goes off, and the studio lights, which, which illuminate the light board. Those never go off. But, but the other lights that illuminate me and the background those lights are off. And actually, in this picture, it looks pretty good. Uh, but the, the problem with this, and, and you can see it here even, because now I've turned the lights on. So, and at this point, uh, the, I think the sort of fancy photographer term is that the natural light sort of blows out the, uh, the light from the studio lights because it's just so much more powerful. Uh, if I had beautiful sun like this every day, I guess I wouldn't need my lights, but that's actually not true, right? So what we have is that, in general, we need room darkening shades. And this is the same picture from before, this picture, but now the shades are drawn and the lights are off, okay? So these room darkening shades, you know, $25, $35 a shade at Home Depot, incredibly powerful. Uh, the room is now a blank canvas, and with it, we can light it. So this lighting here in this picture is exactly what you are looking at when you see me in this picture, right? So I have room darkening shades down. I have a, a drape in front of the in front of the French doors, and what we have is this exact setting where the aperture lights are now lighting me, and this is perfect because what we've done is we've created now a consistent look for the class. So every class that I go into, this is the way it looks, right? Because I fully am controlling the environment that produces it. Just to give one more sense of what that looks like, this is just a quadrant-based view if, if we were to, to sort of move around the studio right now with these lights on. So the, the uh, top left is literally sort of coming in this way from actually from sort of the far corner past the light board side. The top right is what we would be seeing uh, if, the, if the light was actually, if, if the sort of the larger light was, uh, we were taking the shot from that picture into me. The back right is behind me and then the, uh, the back left. So we can see all the ways that, what we see here is that the environment is really controlled. And in particular, you know, if we were to go over to the light board side, it is very dark. And that's exactly what we need if we turn off these particular lights, right? So the whole idea here of what we're trying to accomplish when we do this is to make sure that we're making our process consistent and repeatable across the different you know, class sessions that we offer. So that's a really critical benefit of this kind of studio change. The fourth improvement we want to make, and sort of learning I want to share, is to get everything off the floor. And, and I mean everything. So what you see here uh, is the, the computer is on a cart. Uh, basically everything is here on a cart. The, 
the confidence monitors are on cart, so everything has the ability to move. The light board from Revolution Lightboards itself uh, has wheel, so it can move, right? And this is almost sharing, I, I almost feel like at this exact moment, I'm sharing if you're early in your journey, more than you may want to know. If you've already been on the journey, then you know this. But you are going to make so many changes to your studio along the way. And what you want to do is make those changes as easy as possible on yourself. You want to give yourself the opportunity to be able to experiment, to move things around, to make sure that your teaching studio matches your teaching modalities. And so to do that, you need to get things off the, the ground and ideally on wheels so that they can move around more easily. I should just quick note in passing, if you look at the sort of third picture over, which is the two confidence monitors, those orange bags are actually sandbags. They're, they are necessary for safety. So, uh, so it's, it's not so much that, the, that it's going to tip over, uh, but, but you just need them there so that they don't move around too much, right? You need to sort of, for basic safety, that's a, that's a good best practice to implement. Uh, in a similar fashion, the sort of fifth is you want to keep everything tidy. Uh, and, and what this really means is that everything that can be bundled is bundled. So one of like the favorite things you're ever going to find is this, uh, this, uh, this like tech flex, which allows you to wrap different, uh, different items. It's totally fantastic. Uh, what this does and what you see here is this in practice with a whole set of the wires in the studio. So quite literally all the wires in this studio have reached a point where they are, they are elevated. Uh, so I don't run anything on the ground, like don't want any tripping hazards. Uh, so to see that here, if we take this other view into the studio, you see that this is a, this is a large uh, piece of the TechFlex with many wires which go up then go across, right? So you want all the wires up and out of the way. And I do that with every element of the studio here, all the wiring. Now, unfortunately, unlike putting things on wheels, by, by putting things, you know, by sort of making things much more tidy, we are codifying the existing system. And as such, that does, uh, that does sort of create a barrier to, to making changes to the system. But where it pays for itself over and over again, particularly with a, with, a, with a setup with any complexity, is in debugging. Like, which wire goes where? Well, if things are clearly you know, bundled together, then you know what goes where. So, so that is a really uh, valuable thing to experience. The... Sixth learning for that I wanted to share was the power of using a dedicated studio computer. So in, in this setup, there's a dedicated studio computer. And I like to say that there's a simple litmus test for if you should use a dedicated studio computer. If you use a podium computer on campus, you should use a dedicated studio computer. It will just make your life so much easier. Uh, if you do not, if you bring in your, your PC uh, or you know, uh, you know, tablet, then you want to see is your machine actually capable of running the software you want to broadcast, in particular what we use OBS, and Zoom, and then any other applications you want open at the same time. If, uh, if the answer is yes, then of course, by all means, you're going to, of course, use your existing machine and, and skip past the, the rest of this bullet point. Uh, if no, then you're going to be buying a new machine and, and probably, again, I would recommend that you get a dedicated studio computer versus sort of replacing your other machine. Uh, and the reason, there are just several reasons for this, but, but the, it very much comes back to the, the notion of consistency and uniformity of output in what the students experience. If you have a dedicated studio computer, then you don't have the issues about having to turn off notifications before each class and, and sort of forgetting, right? You don't have all sorts of other stuff being, you know, sort of bogging that machine down. There's also an unfortunate reality, again, as many of us who've been through this journey know, 
which is that at some point you're likely going to have to reformat that computer. Like likely even though things should work with open standards, they don't always work with open standards and, and there are conflicts. And, and I actually had a very specific example of this a week ago. I was working with another faculty member who absolutely had done everything correctly in OBS, but when they pressed scenes, honestly, the scenes didn't change. We, we deleted OBS, we reinstalled it, it didn't work. At that point, it's like the only thing you can do is reformat the machine and do it again, and at that point, it did work. But, but if you're doing that to the machine that's got like all of your, your research work on it, service work on it, you know, that's a frightening proposition. It's not a pleasant proposition when it's the studio computer, but at least it's the studio computer. So I think there's a, a lot of benefit to, to taking the studio computer and, uh, and going that route if, if you are willing. The seventh uh, thing I want to share is to double your line width. So if you're using a document camera, if you're using a tablet and just writing, whatever line width you're using, you need to double it. So I'll just give you a very specific example. Uh, I like to write with fountain pens. This is a 0.4 millimeter line width. And I'm quite confident that this is going to look fine in this video. It will, uh, no pun intended, it will, it will show up because this is being broadcast in high definition. So you are seeing it that way. The problem is, you know, when we start broadcasting to tens of students, through Zoom, the, the signal is compressed and the video is compressed. And literally lines will simply be missing uh, and the students won't be able to see anything. So even I went and tried to find the thickest rollerball I could find, that turned out to be zero point, uh, oh, sorry, that turned out to be 1.5 millimeters. And even when I did this, students, you know, there were students who couldn't see it. So that's why whenever you see me writing with students, I'm always using a fine Sharpie and in that is that fine Sharpie is about three millimeters. And that to me is, is about the right way to do it. So to get, to get a Sharpie at, at three millimeters, that, that is uh, what I have found to be really visible uh, under all circumstances. So that was a, another huge learning that I had to get for myself. Finally, the last one I wanted to mention was sound and the challenges of sound. So, you know, again, we all know that, that you know, that the big three sort of things to, to, to sort of that lock in your studio are sound, you know, lighting and video. But of the three, sound is really the hardest. And just to give a sense of my journey with sound, I actually started as my sound input device with the USB Pre 2. This device was fantastic. Uh, I really, I thought it gave me great sound. The problem was when I went to hook up headphones to it, there was like this hiss I couldn't get rid of. And when I, when I looked it up, it seemed like this was a pretty common problem. As I worked with Andrew and Brian on their studios, I got super jealous of their Go XLRs and the things they could do because they're, they're PC based. So I wanted to do the same. Uh, for those of you that know, it's, it's not available on the Mac or not compatible with the Mac unless you use a dual PC setup, which I did. That actually worked well, but it had too high of a noise floor. So I, I, couldn't, do, I couldn't go with that. Then uh, sort of due to the pandemic, I was you know, trying to find some other things. I, I went with the Motu M4. That was interesting in its own right too, but uh, I ended up just sort of my own personal preference. I ended up liking the USB Pre 2 more than it, mainly because I, I liked its uh, the 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 different sort of visuals it had in front. But none of these ended up working. What did work me for me was a different product from Sound Devices. I ended up going with the uh, the Mix Pre 3, and and this this worked fine for me. So. So this though took a lot of time, time I didn't want to spend on this, but it was important and individual to me. With that, I was then like, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing for microphones. I started with the Sennheiser AVX and I'm like, you know, there's got to be a better microphone. So I'm going to go try microphones. I got smarter. I went and rented all of these microphones, but I rented like the best Sheps microphones and, and it was wonderful to experiment with all of these things. And in the end, 
I kept the AVX. Uh, I, this was the one that just sounded best for me. So my main sort of point for you here is this one, getting sound right and sound that matches the way you want it to sound is really tricky. It's something that's gonna take a little bit of patience and is probably on the critical path for you to complete your studio. So you just wanna take that into account as you're, as you're uh, sort of thinking about all the different steps and the time required. You'll need to leave some sort of both uh, sync time and soak time for, the, for sort of evaluating the sound options. And with that, that concludes my view of the studio learnings. And the, what I welcome you to do is, is take your, your step in the next journey through our world of EdCraft.